Welcome back to the future of transportation, where we explore how technology, policy, and people reshape how the world moves. Today, I'm joined by Kristen White, Google Public Sector's Head of Transportation Strategy and Partnerships. Kristen previously served as Acting Administrator and Deputy Administrator at the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Highway Administration. She is also the COO of ITS America and the Executive Director of Minnesota's Connected and Automated Vehicle Office. She's one of the few leaders who has bridged public service, startups, and big tech, all to advance safer, more equitable, and more sustainable mobility. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Sophia. It's an honor to be joined by you, and I'm so excited to see your enthusiasm in this space, and I can't wait to talk about these topics with you. Yes, I'm so excited to learn more. So we can start with your personal journey. So you've had an incredible career that spans government, startups, and now Google. What first sparked your interest in transportation and mobility? Well, I love getting this question, Sophia, because uh, when I'm going and meeting with people across the country and the globe, it's not often that you find someone that at the age of five or someone much younger than us knew that transportation was a career and that mobility tech was a sector. Uh, And so it just reminds us that we all have a transportation story. And I actually steal that idea from a colleague of mine named Marcus Young, who is a behavioral artist in the city of St. Paul, Minnesota. And what he does is he goes across the country and asks people to make space to gather with folks in transportation and to just take a few centering breaths and think about the first time you actually thought about transportation. And for some of us, it uh, it might have been taking the BART train or the Muni train, right, as a resident in the Bay Area. Um, For those of us that grew up in different parts of the world, I grew up in a really rural part of the country in Western South Dakota. We did not have public transportation. And so in reflecting on um, what my transportation story is and how I got involved in this sector, it's really two different issues. One is my paternal grandfather, Wizard White was his name, uh, was actually killed in a car crash when my dad was 20 years old. And that really impacted our family. It really impacted my dad. It was a theme all throughout childhood, you know, understanding I never got to meet my grandfather and just wondering why. And I didn't put the pieces together until about 20 years later when I was in my 20s and moved to Japan for the first time. And Japan is one of the world's foremost transportation systems, right? I mean, it's so easy to get around even when you're not speaking native Japanese. And thanks to when I was moving to Japan, my first flight over, there was a couple next to me on the plane They were so kind. They, in broken English, were able to teach me about the Chikatetsu, the subway system. They showed me the maps. They took me to learn how to buy a ticket and get onto the train car for the first time. And Akiko-san and her husband actually went with me an hour out of their way to my destination. And I think that story, Sophia, is just a reminder about how powerful it is, the work that we all do, whether it's mobility tech or even on the non-technical side, like our work in transportation and mobility is just to help people safely get where they want to go. And I hope we all continue to achieve that vision. I love that answer. It's incredibly unique. And I've never heard that's such an incredible story about people going out of their way to help you. And I feel like, like you said, everyone has a transportation story. So yeah, it's everyone, everyone is connected to it. And so you're, you're able to help so many people through working on transportation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you actually perfectly segued to my next question. Growing up in a small town in South Dakota, how does your upbringing shape the way you think about equity, access and infrastructure? Yeah. Oh, I love this. And especially because we're recording this the day after Indigenous Peoples Day and South Dakota, my home state, was actually the first state to honor that day because um, the Lakota people are very rich cultural tradition in South Dakota And my parents actually were really involved in what we call the tribal or Indian schools. Um, They would go teach either on reservation or to schools that were predominantly um, uh, Lakota or Dakota students. And so even as a young child, I saw a really stark difference, but I couldn't explain why some parts of my community were well-funded and had good buses and good housing and were able to connect to services And other parts of the community, the Lakota community, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, they were not connected. And that was a lack of mobility. It was a lack of transportation. It was a lack of infrastructure. And that was not by accident. That was intentional. And and I only learned this years later, but I'm, I'm really grateful, Sophia, that my parents 
um, the teachers as they were wanted to teach their children lifelong skills, like how to think about others and serve others. And I remember um, being the age of seven and I, I wanted to be a teacher like my parents. I loved what they did. I loved um, the Lakota culture and wanted to be a part of that. And they told me, well, Kristen, you know, our job as parents is to also teach you that you need to make an income. You need to be able to pay the bills. And it's really hard for your parents to do that. And so they encouraged me to go into a different sector, which is law, which is how I started my career. Um, and I'm very grateful I had parents that were looking out for me. But that's how I started thinking about the future of our communities is really kind of seeing the stark difference between the haves and what we call the have nots. Well, I think you've already given a taste of this, but what personal values or moments have guided your leadership style as you've navigated both the public and the private sectors? Oh, yes. Well, one of the things that I think we all need to take time is to ask ourselves, like, what are our own values? And I was actually just listening to a wonderful podcast with Brene Brown and Adam Grant, two of the people I love to read about. Brene Brown, as many of us know, is a, a social psychologist out of Texas who really talks about these ideas of vulnerability and understanding human emotion. And she brings that into leadership. And in her new book, Strong Ground, she and Adam Grant talk about we really need to sit down and identify our values. And in her Dare to Leadership training years ago when I took it, they give you a list of values and you quickly just go through and pick a bunch that identify with you. And I remember when I first did it, Sophia, I, I probably had 20 different values that I thought were important. And what Brene Brown's literature and teaching reminds us is we should really only focus on three values because having any more than three means you don't have priorities, right? You have too many that you can't focus. And so I've been really thinking about this this year as I've transitioned from public service, from a mission-driven value set towards more of an innovation value mindset. And I think for me personally, in my reflection this year, I've focused on three values um, like curiosity and creative thinking really making sure that we're using our critical thinking, Sophia, to ask, is this what we believe? Is this right? You know, not taking anything at face value and really questioning the world around us. Um, and then the second is really humble leadership. Leadership, in my opinion, is inspiring others to make change. That's actually the definition that Zinger Folkman out of Harvard use. And so leadership means that you are there to lift up others and be a mentor to others, not just to be a manager. And my third value is really about my story about growing up in South Dakota, which is about community values. Like I feel like in anywhere we work or live or play, we should be giving back to our community. And that's why my lifelong mission is to develop transportation innovation products that really do save lives or aspire to. So I'm excited to hear maybe in another few months what your three values are, Sophia. That sounds great. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs>